Welcome to the Scott Holm Podcast. Back on happy, on less than happy terms relative to uh, the episode before. Uh, we're talking about Cougar men's basketball. Now, I would recommend if you haven't already, stop what you're doing right here. Only a minute in this episode. Go listen to our preview of the Cougar men's basketball season. Still very germane. Still have not managed in a week out of publishing to date ourselves. Before that, we were talking about, or as I say, in that episode, we were talking about also a uh, win over TCU preview. Uh, no, we weren't. That was two episodes ago. Go back and listen to that one if you haven't. If you want to hear me a lot happier about uh, Cougar football than I am right now. The bad times reinforce the future good times, Bobby. That's what I'm telling myself because... Boy, howdy, our first subject tonight. Not our only subject. We got a little Cougar men's basketball to talk about. If you want to tempt you to stay through the uh, game we're about to talk about, the game we're about to preview, <laughs> that's on your horizon. We got plenty of sports to talk about here tonight. Uh, how are you feeling generally slash about the Cougar football game that we're going to have to talk about here in a few minutes? Good, man. I'm actually feeling pretty good. Life is uh, finally starting to settle down, as you guys probably saw um, if you watch this on video, you saw me in about nine different backgrounds on three different types of microphones. Um, I miss the, um, I miss the, uh, post game show. Once again, Sam held it down for our, uh, patrons. Uh, I missed that one cause I was in Waco celebrating my dad's birthday while watching the cute cougar game. And we had some other issues with our, uh, with our streaming stuff and technical issues. I was able to Probably squeeze 30 minutes in, but it didn't work. So um, that's why I missed that. But um, finally nice to kind of be home uh, for five straight days, which is something I haven't had in a while. Uh, next time I leave this house will be Saturday morning when I wake up and uh, drive down to uh, one of my favorite cities in the country in uh, in Houston. So also stoked to talk about our uh, sponsor here real quick, Charlie Hustle, charliehustle.com on the World Wide Web, makers of incredibly comfortable vintage collegiate apparel, vintage made fresh, as they like to say, our friends in Kansas City over there. Great Cougar collection, great Big 12 school in general collection. If you are one of the, we know, non-zero number of non-Cougar fans checking this out, Utah fans may be listening, trying to get a pulse on what's going on with this week's football opponent. Uh, fantastic Cougar collection there. Uh T-shirts, obviously, I'm wearing one right now. Uh, quarter zips, uh, sweatshirts. I wore, wore a sweatshirt when I married man. I've been on my uh, my local news station out here. Don't worry, for good reasons. Uh, Rep and Charlie <laughs> Hustle wear as well. Also, a couple jackets. I, I am getting this way about I'm, I'm going to be uh, adding the red Charlie Hustle jacket to my collection very much sooner than later. And you can make that order a little cheaper by using our promo code. Any order, first order, hopefully 101st order using our promo code POD15, that's P-A-W-D-15, and that is going to save you 15% on your order of fantastic Charlie Hustle wearables. Also, if you like what we're doing here and you're not already doing so, we know a number of you do, and we really appreciate those of you who have made that plunge. Uh, Support us by going to patreon.com slash shpodcast, a little 16 cents a day, and if you're able to give so many more, if you're so inclined, you can support the uh, work that Bobby and I do here on a weekly basis, talking about the Houston Cougars and talking about the Houston Cougars here for... Now in our 10th season, if you if you like that, you want to support that even with a small amount of discretionary income, we are just super appreciative. And as Bobby alluded to the top, you will be getting at least one premium episode per week. Usually this time of year are Cougar football instant reacts, which I, I've enjoyed doing. You've enjoyed doing and hopped on with me. If all of that sounds good to you, patreon.com slash sh podcast. And of course, support our network friends, the 1012 network, talking all things big 12 over there, the 1012 podcast, a number of other Big 12 specific pods by going to and following on T at T N one, two network, 10, 12, wherever you put podcasts in your ears, Bobby. Yes, I've sir. delayed no more. He's the football lost 42 to 14 at Arrowhead stadium on Saturday afternoon to the Kansas Jayhawks, a previously one in five Kansas Jayhawks team. Even though this wasn't a shutout, taking it all into account, considering the performance, considering the opponent, I've had a few days to think about it. And for me, it's still a close call whether this one or the Cincy game is this team's worst all-around performance in 2024. I don't feel any definitive... I don't feel worse about an overall performance from Cougar football than I do about this game. So with that great and happy intro, Bobby, what were your your three overlooked plays or early thoughts you just got to get off your chest about uh, Saturday's game against the Jayhawks? 
Yeah, you know, for me, just the overall thoughts was, um, I don't necessarily disagree with you that this was an absolutely brutal performance from the Cougars. I think we might differ a little bit on how we think of this game and the different things that we think about this game. And uh, we'll obviously get into that a little bit more, but definitely just a disappointing performance overall, especially coming off that TCU game. But uh, three overlooked plays. So, um the very first drive for Kansas, you could almost make the case that entire drive just kind of set the tone for the game and what it was going to look like. But the big play just kind of that caught my attention early on as I was rewatching this game was there was a fourth and one on their very first drive. They go down and it's an easy pickup and that leads, you know, if you get a stop there. Maybe this game looks a little bit different. You have a little bit of momentum. Sure, they took a lot of time off the clock, but fourth and one on their very first drive. Um, And uh, yeah, not a, uh, not a, it was just a sign of things to come. It was just a basic run uh, by, by uh, Jalen Daniels, just a real, um, I want to say it was an option where he just decided to keep it. Uh, They kind of had the pitch guy out there and you knew he wasn't going to pitch it. It was fourth and one. Why take the risk? You just kind of run it up right there, pick up the easy one. Um, I think he ended up getting two or three on it. So he picked it up pretty easy. Kansas goes down, holds the ball for nine minutes and, uh, and comes away with a touchdown there. Um, then you have the, the other one that was a big play for me was the reverse that Kansas ran right after the review. I don't know if you remember, there was that, uh, controversial call you know i i, I, do, I do remember that one in fact. I, I would i would say that he probably didn't get his foot in but at the same time he was pretty open it was a good throw good catch it you can't you can't argue too much with it you know i i thought but i also think that if houston is making that play if they overturn it i would be upset you know what i mean so that's kind of me going like okay yeah like it was a 50-50 ball. You're going to get that call. Sometimes you're not. But it's not that play that was the uh, kind of game changer, even though it was. But there was a reverse right after that. Uh, the next play was the reverse. Gets them down to the one play after that. Touchdown. Seven Kansas. I think that puts them up uh, 14 nothing or 21. I can't remember exactly. 14. Off the top you're of my head. 14. I'm pretty sure it was 14. Um, I don't know why my brain was just like, oh, yeah, what was that? Um, that's probably my second play. And then... Another one, I had I had it down to two here. Um, so you're picking two plays for your, you, you have no, two plays. For your no, okay. no, I, you know, I've been I'm sitting on this trying to think, think which I'm just one. Gonna leave it at that. Just th- for me, I think um, it comes down to this one. 48 seconds left to go in the first half. Donovan Smith breaks free, uh, runs the ball, has a great run. And then he just slides. He just slides. And look, I get it. Zeon Chris is down. You don't need him to take. And and Donovan knows that Zeon Chris is probably out the rest of the game at that point, right? Or at least that the other quarterback is in. You want him to be a little conservative there. But there wasn't a ton around him. And if he continues to run, he picks up five, maybe 10 more yards there. And if he does the next play, two plays later, there's sacks. You know, you go back-to-back sacks after that or a loss of or a like run of no gain and then back-to-back sacks, you're out of field goal range two plays later. You were already on the borderline of field goal range. You take two sacks two plays later, you're out of field goal range. You throw the interception, that pretty much ends the half. Just kind of one of those things where you just go, what if he runs 10 more yards? You can take a sack there, and now you're at the borderline of field goal range, and this field goal unit hasn't exactly uh, inspired a lot of confidence this year, but you at least have a chance to kick the ball there if he doesn't slide. So that, to me, was a kind of a game-changing play there. I know that sounds kind of ridiculous to put on a uh, a, a last two minute drill kind of deal to end the first half. But if he, if he picks up 10 more yards, you get, you get three there. You go into halftime down 11. It feels a little bit different. And credit to you, Bobby, you within a minute or two of that number play, number three, Thomas with sliding prematurely texted me about it. So it was, this was on your radar for a while. And, and I, I fully agree with you that it was a weirdly early slide for a guy who, in his career has run a fair amount. A guy who's still to present day in this offense when he's in the field, I guess in this case when Zion Chris was hurt, is asked to run a decent amount. It was a surprisingly early slide. 
meets the criteria? Is it is it one of the most important highlight reel making plays? No, but it, it was it was one I noticed. It was one significant and one that yeah you know, I don't know. Like you for an offense that moved the ball a decent amount, you made you had surprisingly few actual trips close to Kansas's end zone. So yeah, getting a little bit closer, who knows how different that is. My first play like yours is also from the opening possession of the game. And it might be kind of odd on its face for me to say the very first play of this game meets any definition that's like overlooked. But your first play in this one, if you don't remember, was a face mask penalty on Latravion mm-hmm. McCutcheon. <laughs> I don't want to overstate this play's importance because the full, fo- the full football game made it 100% clear that U of H had no answer for Kansas's offense and very few for the defense. But that opening penalty turned the situation, the opening drive from Kansas having really bad starting field position to Kansas having respectable field position. I believe they were, and they started that on the 29 and, and I didn't pick this play because I don't think Kansas couldn't have just gone 86 yards in their opening drive for the score. I picked it because one, it's another unfortunate example of the Cougs being the Cougs and on special teams specifically. And two, if you watch this one live, I don't think any play gave you a better indicator that this one was going to be three plus hours of mostly pretty badly played football from the Cougs. And it meets the definition overlooked because I think the first play of the game in a play that didn't involve a score specifically, or even immediately before a score, I think it's easy to kind of forget about that one. Definitely a tone setter, but not a positive tone setter. My next one, in my opinion, meets the overlooked criteria because it was on a drive where U of H scored. And this was, this was the Cougs second and final scoring drive of the game. The one that ended with that long Makai Muse touchdown catch and run. This was a screen pass to Rashawn Sanford that ended a five yard loss on second and one. If you'll recall, that was right after the first two plays of this drive were really positive ones. You had a 10 yard Sanford run for the first down. And then right before that nine or right after that, right before the play I'm mentioning a nine yard completion from Smith to Makai Muse. Then on second and one, Smith dumps the ball off to Sanford. What looked like it was supposed to be a screen pass, but by the time Smith is actually releasing the ball, there are obviously way too many KU defenders in the backfield mm-hmm. for this thing to even have a remote chance mm-hmm. of working. And yet Smith still gives the ball to his right your freshman running back in a really bad spot. Everything about this is wrong. So this decision making, the execution by your line, and I'm not sure this offense has successfully executed a screen pass like that all season. Certainly didn't happen very often in the five years of Daniel Holgerson either. And it was a play that really demonstrated the multifaceted problems that this offense had against Kansas and this offense has had much of the 2024 season. My last play, I was laughing earlier when I asked you if you had two plays because our literal minded uh, former co-host, co-host Emeritus, decent chance he's listening to this is going to give me crap because I'm going to combine two plays into one for my third pick here. They're two back-to-back extremely similar plays. Apologies. If you or anyone else listening out there just is so angry at me that you want to just turn off this episode or Bobby's case, I guess, <laughs> and leave, leave the chat in disgust. But I picked it, again, because it's two different back-to-back first-down runs by Kansas quarterback Jalen Daniels. They're in the same drive in, in the latter stages of the third quarter. Neither of those were a scoring play, though this would be a drive where Daniels would end it by calling his own number and running for the touchdown. This is when they went up 35-14. I thought those two runs were just the cherry on top of an abysmal defensive performance. And if I could pinpoint it, probably the exact moment that I lost any belief that U of H was going to do anything defensively to keep this team in this game, I probably already lost belief by that point that the offense could actually cut into Kansas' deficit. So no real pleasant place to start for our kind of larger attempt to break this game down. And I don't think either of us would give either the offense or the defense better than an F grade for Saturday's performance. But I've been curious about your answer to this since the moment we agreed to kind of lead the segment off this way. From the gut, who do you think played worse on Saturday, the offense or the defense? And make your case. Yeah, I'm going to go with um, I'm going to go with the offense. And the reason why I'm going with the offense is um, you you saw some. I think we saw some of the worst decision making out of our quarterback play that we have seen in a very long time. Um, and, and that's not only on Donovan Smith. Zeon Chris had a, 
in his couple of drives didn't look great either. Um, but the offense just, it, it, it took such a step back after the TCU game. It felt like we took such a big step forward in the TCU game. And maybe that's Zeon Chris not coming in and playing in the, uh, playing, playing that much in the, uh, in, in the, er, in the game in general. Maybe that's what we're seeing there, but, um, I got to go with the offense. The defense wasn't good, but the defense held, um, held, um, held them scoreless, held Kansas scoreless in the third quarter um, until that drive that you kind of mentioned just now kind of kept the Cougs in this game a little bit. Um, not that 28 points is keeping keeping you in the game, but at the same time, the offense wasn't putting up a ton of drives and things like that. So it just kind of felt like the defense kind of recomposed themselves in, in the second half in that third quarter. You had probably the worst drive uh, of Cougar football of the year with that first drive uh, on the defense, offensive or defensive, I would say that is quite possibly the worst drive either unit has had all season. But that third quarter, your defense came out, stood on their head a couple of times, got some stops, um, and it just it didn't work out. The offense couldn't get anything going. I think if the offense puts up three or they put up seven in that third quarter, I think the fourth quarter looks a whole lot different. My answer is also the offense. I want to be clear that this is not an endorsement of the Cougar defensive performance. I, th I think it's more opponent specific, my logic here, because the only thing I could say positively about the defensive performance is that KU is unmistakably coming into this one in a positive direction on offense. You look at their last three losses. I'm sure their offense went missing at some key points, but those were all pretty clearly games where the KU offense was the better unit. They, the offense had a number of key guys who have been veterans on good offenses before. Like Jalen Daniels has had some injury problems, but Jalen Daniels, if he has extended run playing, it isn't just horribly injured, which he did, didn't really look like prior to this. That's a guy who's going to figure it out to some degree. Daniel Highshaw, even though he didn't play very much, is Devin Neal, their awesome running back, who did play and really hurt the Cougs in this one. And, and a lot of receivers really... Luke Grimm, their by far leading receiver coming into it, was hardly a factor in the passing game in this one, though he did have a, a critical reverse. That I, I believe he was the guy who was the, the ball carrier on that play you were mentioning in the um, overlook plays. This defense, the Jayhawks defense, in the balance of the season, pretty, pretty lousy. Scoring 14 points against this Kansas defense, I'd say is a much worse performance. Kansas's defense had 12 tackles for loss and six sacks. Bobby, in the three full Big 12 games Kansas played prior to this one, they'd only managed 11 tackles for losses and four sacks. And those numbers, I said, the 12 and 6, could have been even worse. Like, it, it could have given up seven or eight sacks. That was how bad the performance was. Yeah, you lost your starting quarterback early in this one. Over the course of the game, you lost two starting offensive linemen. But even if all three of those guys stay healthy, I didn't see any evidence that this game wasn't going to go any differently than it did. You had had points where you thought, ah, they could get back in this game, but never where you thought U of H is even playing close to on this opponent's level. But I think we've, we're, we're going to talk more bad about the offense, but we've been kind of comparatively nice to the defense, which isn't deserved. This was a terrible performance. Where did it go wrong? And, and what did you see from that group on Saturday that you'd want to talk about? Yeah, we just got beat on the front seven. Our, they they had plenty of time to throw. They had massive holes to run through. I don't think that the defensive secondary defensive secondary was necessarily good, but I don't think they were as bad as it appeared because Jalen Daniels had all day to throw. He had all day to get rid of the ball, and it showed. I mean, they picked us apart all over the place. Now, like I said earlier, I think this – Having gone back and watched the game again today, um, I don't think this performance was as bad as maybe it felt in real time. It felt like we couldn't get a stop, that we couldn't get them to to not pick up five yards per play. And, you know, going back, looking through at the stats, maybe they got close to that or something like that. But there were definitely moments by this defense where they kind of stood on their head and they got some stops and they really buckled down when they needed to. Not to say that this was a good performance by any means, um, but... It, they figured something out at halftime, but, you know, eventually it started to burst. And, uh, yeah, I, it, 
just getting beat on the front, just getting beat on the front, uh, but it, the front seven getting beat as badly as they did, um, is just going to cause a problem every single week. It doesn't matter who you're playing. If, if their guys are able to just basically pick you up and move you out of the way and uh, not let you touch their quarterback, you're going to have a hard time winning football games. You're nicer than me. I don't think there's anything remotely redeeming about this defensive performance other than the fact that you were going against a Kansas offense that I think is is better, has performed better than the, the Kansas defense this year. I mean, they had 30-something rushes for 200-something yards. That sounds like last year's defense. Not to boil everything down to one stat. That's It lines up with what you saw. Like that stat. Like you don't mm-hmm. see that stat and you think, no, no, they didn't. No, they got whatever they wanted in the run game. Mm-hmm. And that's not something I can say about any game we've been on here this year. Like UNLV had a decent rushing total at the end. That's because they ran it almost 50 times. Since he did have a game-changing long touchdown run when they took that big early lead in that one, but even with that in there, that wasn't a bad performance from your front seven. There was one one bad play to key juncture. Can't absolve your defense of that, but it wasn't a full game of getting pushed around by Cincy. For the most part, they got two or three yards a pop. One time, they got 40-something yards at a key point. It happens. That gave us much more an offensive failing than a defensive, though. Not a great defensive performance. Kansas got whatever they wanted in the run game. Like it never looked hard for them to run the ball. And I can't say about any other game this year. Like, yeah, they've been I, a good rushing offense, but this isn't the good rushing off the first good rushing offense we've seen this defense face. I, you know, I will I will just to sorry to interrupt you. No, just you're to I, I definitely agree that this this front seven just got got the got to shove down their throats, right? Um, what I, you know, to kind of defend the, uh, to go back to the thing you talked about, you can't absolve the, the defense from a big play. Um, 54 of Devin Neal's rush, uh, rush yards came on one single play, uh, late in the game. Cougs were already down 35, 14. It felt like this game was pretty much done by that point. Not again, to absolve the defense, but it just kind of felt like, that was, how do I say it? Like, it, it, by that point, it looked like the team had kind of just been defeated. <laughs> yeah, but you also had the 30-something yard reverse yeah. to Luke Grimm that set up a, a short touchdown in the first half. You had the two plays that I mentioned, two different 10-plus yard runs by yeah. Jalen Daniels on the, the drive that I think really broke the Cougs back to go up 35-14. Yeah, maybe... Yeah, you're right. Maybe Devin Neal's numbers are a bit skewed from one late run, but you don't take issue with the major, the right. major, the no, I'm no. saying, right? And, and I do agree with you. Jalen Daniels might have been the least touch quarterback in all of Division One on Saturday, the least yeah. harassed quarterback. You could put just about every starting quarterback this level in Daniels' shoes. I'm not saying they do as well as Daniels did because he's a good veteran quarterback who has dual threat ability, who's season numbers before Saturday probably weren't indicative of what he's really capable of. This is kind of water finance level, but you put a lot of starting quarterbacks back there. They probably have a very good or even a career game. You give a lot of quarterbacks out there. Mm-hmm. Clean pockets. Can you imagine, like you imagine being diamond Smith and like looking over there and be like, I'm not saying he did this. I'm not at all implying that, but just looking over there and saying, I like that. If I just had like <laughs> four or five clean seconds to like go down my progression and not just, within one to two seconds be thinking about the defensive tackle that's about to cave the pocket in on you, th- things like that. Jalen Daniels is far, far, far too good of a quarterback to have as easy of a time back in the pocket as you did on Saturday. And, and again, before anyone out there thinks that I sound too calm about this performance, I wanted to throw my TV – or sorry, throw my remote into my TV – on that the play where Devin Neal basically he gets it's the it's a touchdown to go up 20 and nothing. Devin Neal gets the direct snap and basically just walks untouched into the end zone from three or four yards out for Kansas to go up 20 and nothing. It was that was that was piss poor. I'm not gonna throw out the entire season because of that. I think that would be that'd be a fallacy, but the game the performance was terrible. The numbers are if anything, I think a, a, a real indication of what we all watched for a few hours on Saturday. A really a really poor defensive performance. I'm not going to give up on this defense or say the whole season. But I, I, there's an indi- indication from fans nowadays to just be a slave to the moment, just be like, oh, this defense is 
garbage. The worst like, defense of this all is time. Even, yeah, you, you all, you're, you're never as good as your best performance. You're never as bad as your worst performance. And this defense has been good far more often than not this season. Mm-hmm. But that was piss poor. Like I'm not going to go on here and call yeah. – Call something anything other than what it is, and that was your defensive right. performance. And Bobby, we both agreed that defensive performance was probably the better of the two main units. So, where do you start with this offense? Where where do you start? You know, the TC game is probably the high point of the season in terms of you, me, and everyone else's fan base starting to see the vision, starting to feel a little bit more optimistic about the offense. Are we back to square one, ma'am? You know, I would say we. I don't think we are because we didn't see Zeon Chris. Sorry. Um, you know, that would be the thing that would keep me from that. That keeps me from um, saying that we're back at square one. We saw Zeon Chris for a little bit. Not that the offense looked good under him for those two drives, but you know, kind of what I can say is, um, we didn't see the offense that we saw versus TCU because we didn't have the quarterback. That being said, the offense was atrocious. This offensive line looked like they took a massive step back. Um, again, to your point, you lost two starters, so I get it to injuries and things like that. But, you know, it it became that, that thing again where I, I did it today, right? I stopped after a sack and it had been two seconds from snap until... Um, there were five guys looking down at a, uh, at a pile of football players with Donovan Smith being on the bottom and there are four blue jerseys on top of them. And there's five white jerseys looking down like, Oh man. Um, now is that, you know, Donovan Smith's first play, you saw a corner come off the edge. It looked like he looked right at the corner and didn't dump it off to the outlet right there. That's one of the, you know, not that I know more about playing quarterback or anything like that than, you know, somebody like Zion Chris or, or a coach there. But one thing I have watched enough people talk about football is throw where the blitzers are coming from. And he saw him come. He had a guy in the flat right there and he just missed him. And he just didn't throw it, didn't dump it, took the sack. And it was just, and the guy came untouched. You know, the, the, uh, the, the blitzer came untouched. And it was just just a bad performance by the offensive line. Again, here we are sitting here again going, this offensive line just did not look very good. And is that partly Donovan Smith holding the ball too long? Maybe. You know, maybe it is because you didn't see that with Zeon. It, it kind of looks like Zeon goes through two progressions and then runs, whereas Donovan Smith you know, Not kind the of worst being, idea with this offense right now, honestly. Yeah, and, and you know, Donovan Smith being the son of a coach, right? Probably a kid who's played quarterback his entire career has uh, learned from some of the best quarterback minds you can probably think of just because of who his dad is and the connections that he has and the people that he's probably been around his entire life. Probably a better quarterback overall. Not as good in the system. It seems he wants to get through three, four progressions before he tucks and runs. And with this offensive line, it just doesn't seem like he can do that. From the jump, the offensive line looked really unprepared. Got their butts kicked for four quarters this one, plain and simple. I rarely regret opinions. Bobby, I almost regret saying it when we were talking about the TCU game that the O-line might be figuring something out. Because if anything, it's... It was kind of serendipitous that Chris went out with an early injury that doesn't sound like it will sideline him for an extended period of time because, I mean, the way KU was getting pressure, man, that could have become an even worse situation the way they were getting after Donovan Smith. In real time, it was also kind of serendipitous. I guess that's that's why we're here the show. That Smith came in when he did because you didn't see the KU defense struggle for at least a little bit with the different look that Smith gives you. I don't know if the first interception one that was intended for Devin Williams, where that was the that was the drive where the defense was kind of giving you an unexpected bonus possession at the end of the second quarter. I don't know if that was Williams running the wrong route, Smith not knowing where his receiver was supposed to be. Don't know about that. I guess the wrong run was route, if I had to guess, but that doesn't let Smith off the hook for the next two interceptions. And the first one he threw in the third quarter was unconscionably bad. That, that's just a throw that you just cannot make there, point blank. I, I know I'm not the one back there having to stay in the pocket 
and make throws. This guy has forgotten more about being a quarterback than I'll ever know. It's still not an unreasonable ask as a Cougar fan to want your fifth year senior quarterback to not throw the ball there in a dangerous spot, to throw it somewhere where his guy or nobody can get it, to to get out of the pocket and throw at the sidelines and just live to play another day. Anything like that, anything but throwing the ball there in a situation where you needed that scoring drive, like you needed to keep putting pressure on Kansas, a team that's blown a lot of leads this year, Bobby. Like I'm not saying, because I saw a defensive performance. I'm not saying, and to your point of the defense earlier, they did have some brief momentum in the second, late second, third quarter. Like, do you, at that point, if you score and it's 28, 21, Kansas starts tightening up at the sidelines. It's here we go again. Another possible blow lead in a big 12 game. And you, I don't know, man, maybe you start doing some things psychologically to them. I don't think so. Like, I think the 42, 14 was probably reflective of who's the better team there, but just through an interception in a way and in a spot that you just cannot have from somebody that's this better. Bobby, after that second touchdown drive, let's hear the final result for the remaining U of H offensive possessions in this game. If you will let me go ahead, bud. interception, Interception, punt, interception, turnover on downs, turnover on downs. That's brutal. Like, that's just absolutely brutal, regardless of the opponent. And I'm trying to beat this to death, but this might have been the worst Big 12 defense you'll see this year. Yep. Certainly among, like, the worst few that you'll see this year. And they were able to do this little against them. Probably good to ask a big picture question here that we wanted to kick around while we're talking about the offense. Acknowledging we don't have a complete season to truly analyze right now, Bobby, what would it take for you over these next five regular season games to not want U of H's staff to go after a veteran starting quarterback that's coming off season in the portal to have that guy compete with Zeon Chris and whoever else is coming in and coming back uh, for the Cougs at quarterback? You know, I like that you asked the question because this was kind of my question that I posed to you and a certain former host of this. And, um, you know, I think I'm a little bit less harsh than you are just kind of where we discussed and not to kind of spoil your answer or anything, but, um, I definitely think that for me to see it, I really want to see some progress by Zeon Chris. Um, I, if you would have asked me this question after the TCU game, I think my answer looks a whole lot different. Um, I want to see Zeon Chris actually be healthy and play three, four games, you know, after, um, after, you know, through this, I want to see him uh, actually stay healthy because I like what he does talent wise. You get two years. It actually is a great jumping off point for um, Isaiah Hallwell's uh, recruitment. You know, you have Keyshawn Henderson. You're getting Keyshawn the, Henderson. You're, I you're got my five star uh, commits mixed up. How no foolish of me. My bad. My bad. My bad. Keyshawn Henderson's. Uh, Sorry, you know, you, you're right. I started writing it. Like, I didn't know Isaiah Harwell was a football player. Yeah, yeah, my bad, guys. Um, wow, that was really bad. Um, but it's a perfect, it's a perfect transition for him to, uh, to kind of come in. You get, you get Zion next year and then you, uh, you'll, you'll get, you'll get Henderson the next year. Um, and, and, and to compete with a senior Zion, Chris, I kind of, I kind of like the way that sounds. Um, I think if you bring in another transfer portal kind of guy, you're probably looking at getting somebody who's going to be a junior next year. Um, Cause if you go sophomore, then you are going to have that, um, that, that kind of butting heads with the, with the new five star, your new shiny five star toy. Granted, he makes it to uh, campus if we're being honest here. But um, I yeah, d- we'll be holding our breath. Not saying we have any intel yeah. here or anything like that. It's just, yeah, but you're gonna be holding me, your breath until he signs. Yeah, sorry. But for me, I really, really, I just want to see Zion be healthy and play kind of like he did in the TCU game. If you give me TCU game Zion, Chris, I don't think that I necessarily am banging on the table to get another quarterback in here, especially if you can keep Ollie. I hope dearly that the next five games prove me wrong for what I'm about to say. Cause you know, my answer, my answer has not changed since we talked about this off air. Nothing like I, I, I want, I would tell Zion Christie in the season. Don't find it. It's not, find a new school kind of conversation because I have seen things. I like, I want this guy at his best to be right. Like, I think he's a great fit for this offense. I think he is a special athlete and a guy who I think has a higher ceiling as a pass than maybe we've seen. Bobby, you know what these last two games have in common? Not very much, thankfully. He left both of them hurt. 
Yep. This is not me saying this guy can and he and he missed uh, the last month of last season. This is not me saying he can't be healthy. That along with the fact that I think it's been an inconsistent product from him, I think the conversation you have with him at this season is we're going to bring in a guy to comp- we're probably going to bring in a guy to compete. We are not going to hand him the job. We are not going to promise him that, but expect to have to rewin this job because I haven't seen enough from him, and I don't think in the remaining five games I'll see enough from him to be like we need to put all our eggs in this basket. I so think you not let, to, you, so I think just, you let next next off season be a competition between this guy acknowledging that you don't know if this guy's in the portal. Like I'm talking about an archetype of player, right? right. There might not be a guy who fits that description who's interested in U of H. Sorry. What's your question? Yeah, that, no, no, no. I mean, so, exactness there. Yeah. So I think, I think my question to you, I kind of comes twofold here. One, do you think a guy who fits that kind of archetype that you said is going to come here knowing that he's going to have to battle with an incumbent to be QB one, right? Guys who are entering in the portal, uh, kind of like knowing that they're going to play. That's kind of why they're in the portal. Um, but number two is, I mean, there's got to be something uh, Zion Chris can do, right? If we go five and zero oh over the next five, and he, not saying that you'll see it, right? But there's got to, uh, to me, if he goes out and he does this, right? I think for me, I go, yeah, well, shit, Zion Chris is our starter next year, right? I, I, so, so if he did something like that, would you still have the discussion? We're not going five and zero. Oh. I'm sorry. Like, I'm no, a, no, no, I, no. I'm not saying that's a possibility. But I'm saying, you know? but I'm saying if he does, right? The question is, what does he have to do to get the to get you to not do it? If he went five and zero, oh, right? As much as I don't think that it's possible, or that it's going to happen, or that he stays healthy for five games, or anything like that, that would make you want to keep him, right? Yeah, sure. It's not going to happen though. Like, right? I'm not saying, but next but, time I go to a casino and play a ten, a, you know, a ten cent slot machine, if I hit the three point five million dollar jackpot. I'm gonna I'm gonna text my boss. This is my two weeks notice. <laughs> I am not going to be winning the three point five million dollar grand right. prize slot machine well, anytime soon. But the so but I the question to... is what could happen, right? Okay. In the, you know, so that's kind of for me. It's like there's got to be something he can do to make you not want to do it. Here's here's my answer: be a, a consistently decent passer and stay healthy. I think he's going to be able to do at max one of those two things. And I'm not sure he can do either. And to your, your actually your first point is totally valid. Like you're probably not going to get the, the you're probably not going to get the, the level of transfer that I'd want without tell, telling Chris that, Hey, like there's a good chance you don't win your job or find a new program. Then I'd be, then I'll be honest. Like my lean would be to just, be up front with him and tell him we'll give you the best recommendation we can give and help you get in the portal as soon as possible and find the next program. Cause I don't think he's, I don't think he's a quarterback capable of doing what we need to do at this level. I could be wrong. And I, I'm, I hope the next five games Zion Chris shows me enough to, to be like, Hey man, I was really hasty a month or so ago. Like this is, this is the guy. Like I, I would love that to be a serious question that there's enough over the next five games to give me that, kind of serious question i don't think there is i don't think there's things he could do realistically that aren't going to make me think hey man somebody who's maybe a bit more proven of a passer if not maybe a little bit worse runner who is you know all american fcs level quarterback or all conference conference usa or something like that is worth worth a look and then you know maybe let austin carlisle be the backup as a true freshman and get or uyale and get maybe a little bit more meaningful game reps for him that way you know just a i know we're kind of going a little bit long here because we got a lot to cover but like let me throw a name out there um jackson arnold you know not that he's entered the portal or anything like that but uh he's a guy who looks like he's gonna go in the portal we played him earlier this year you know when i was in oklahoma the younger the younger people were saying how uh they thought that he had the potential to become Baker at some point, what would you think of somebody like that? And do you think we attract that kind of guy? I would be interested in him. I I believe everything I said about his physical tools. He didn't get a five-star rating just by playing at a DFW, a a nice DFW suburb power and having a certain haircut. Like the guy, the guy's a football player. The guy got there for a reason. 
there's clearly some stuff wrong in Oklahoma that is not Jack Arnold specific. But my concern is that would he just be trading Oklahoma's problems in terms of supporting cast and team kind of building an offensive identity and working from a talent deficit from the problems he has in Oklahoma right now? And would he rightfully, as a former five-star quarterback, have an NIL ask that's a little ambitious? So those would be my concerns, but I would be, I'd be very interested by Jack Snarl. I wouldn't be like, sign me up, tell Zion Chris to beat it. Like, I don't know if he's that much, but I think depending on his interests, like if he's willing to take a, hey, you'll compete with this guy, yeah, give him a shot. But I, I don't know that'll be a case with his recruiting pedigree. Yeah. So let me let me ask you one more thing, because I think this is just an interesting Cougar conversation that maybe isn't best for a a, a wrap up uh, episode of a game. Hey. But let me let me ask you this. So you you were talking about an FCS All American or maybe even like an All Conference um, G five kind of quarterback who wants to kind of take the next step up. Isn't that kind of what you have with uh, Zion Chris? Yeah, is that kind of what you got? Not, not all. I mean, some of those guys pan out. Some of them don't. Yeah. Fair enough. Like some of the guys Fair we enough. talked about on defense, like Carlos Allen, just use him, him as an example, has been quite good, has has proven himself to be a guy more suited to playing at a Big 12 level than for Kennesaw State. Yeah. Not every uh, – Isaiah Hamilton, who's at Ole Miss now, who came through this program last year, was your one bright spot on a pretty crummy defense last year. Guy who was ready to make the jump. Yeah. Not everyone is. Like So it's an inex- recruiting – oldest cliche in the book about it in exact science. Yep, but you're but you're right. Like similar, similar profile, you have to you have to hope that this guy and you and you would and it would be fair to ask questions from from what I'm saying here to be like, wow, they, they liked him enough to bring him in, but like sour him after a year. Like, I, yeah, I don't think what I am proposing. I don't think that's the most likely outcome. I'm just saying what Sam would do given the question you asked. I, if College I had football to guess, twenty five Sam. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If I had to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. if I had to guess, he will be on this team next year and probably have the inside track to the starting quarterback job that, that if you had to make me guess something that I'm putting money on or something like that, it's going true. That would be my guess. Very nice. Any other offensive thoughts? here? I thought the play calling was kind of weird in spots too. There's that third and five on the Cougs second possession where it was a run between the tackles to Jamarian Burnett suffer no gain. Not a call. I'd be nitpicking on third and one or third and two. He's like, Oh, it didn't work, but it's the right idea for that down a distance. It was kind of a strange call on third and medium. Uh, if you take out the sack yardage, this was the worst rushing performance anyone's had against the KU defense since week two of the season. Just a really bad offensive performance going with a really bad defensive performance from a really bad overall def- performance, Bobby. That's, that's I think, all I have left to say about, uh, about this game. Yeah, I think some of the play calls, it, I think it's easy not to, not to say anything you know negative to what you said because I absolutely agree, but I think it is... Uh, when you can do nothing offensively, when nothing's working, play calls look a lot worse because you can't do anything. Nothing worked on Saturday offensively. Yeah, lower priority thing. There, there's there's a reason why. There's a reason why it's getting talked about forty something minutes in. And, and <laughs> yeah, I, and you can and you can nitpick you, you could nitpick plays from even even games. This team, this team has won this year. Bobby, our next opponent, the Utah Utes, are something. Something of a mercy for the Cougar defense and something of a heinous punishment for the, the Cougar offense. Uh, a Cougar defense that's coming off its worst performance this season will get to return home and face a Utah Utes offense that was doing bad enough in the current season that their offensive coordinator stepped down on Sunday night. I think it was officially announced yesterday morning, but was first reported Sunday night after their 13-7 home loss to TCU. I'm pretty cynical about midseason coordinator firings and those having any kind of measurable positive short-term impact versus just being something that makes the fan base feel better and probably better done the week after Thanksgiving. Utah's having a rough offensive season though, man. And it's, it's the primary, uh, probably exclusive reason that this Utah team isn't contending for the big 12. Like I think most preseason expectations had around that program. That's why, even though I, question whether or not the midseason coordinator firing is going to make a difference. I also get it. You haven't broken 19 points in three weeks. You're averaging under 20 points per game against FBS opponents. Just scored seven at home to a TCU team that we saw this Cougar offense work. This Cougar offense that's been mostly bad this year worked this TCU defense. What do they do next week? 
they go on the road and hold an opponent to seven points. Like that's how bad this Utah offense is. Bobby, you offense, defense, whatever it is. What have you learned about the Utah Utes uh, coming into this week? Yeah, like you said, uh, just fired their their OC, brought in a new one who I um, don't know how to pronounce his name, Sam. Mike Baj- Bajakian. Bajakian, thank you. Um, interesting choice to bring him in as OC. Uh, he was the OC at Northwestern, um, and they didn't exactly light up the scoreboard when he was there. Um, ranked 120th in yards and 129th in scoring. So, you know, you, you fire your OC to then promote this guy who doesn't score. So it's a very interesting choice for uh, for Utah here. Um, you know, I think it's more of a move that they did to kind of fire up their team, kind of like if you've ever watched hockey, right? If you, if you have ever watched hockey, Sam, which I know you have because you're a uh, Vegas Golden Knights fan. Um, one of I the heard. things, one of the things you have a license plate, if I recall. I have two jerseys. Look, man, I'm <laughs> tongue in cheek. Tongue in cheek. But I explain yeah. more because it looks cool. Anyway, sorry. So, so um, in hockey, if your goalie gives up like three early on, even if they're not his fault, right? One could be a breakaway. It could be a fluky tip in or something like that. You just kind of pull your goalie and switch them out and you just go, hey, tonight's your night. Maybe you're not seeing the puck. But really, instead of it demoralizing the goalie, which sometimes does happen, um, and what it does more so is just gives the team fired. It just fires the team up in you. And the coach kind of goes, look, you got this guy pulled. It's a team thing. This is what we can do. Don't let the next guy get screwed over like this. You can't let the next guy get hit with a bunch of this. It kind of feels like one of those moves with this offense, um, especially with who they replaced them with. It feels like something that's just like, we don't have an answer right now. It's not necessarily all the play calling. You know, our starting quarterback, our 29th year senior um, quarterback is hurt. He's down. He's out. He's hurt again. You know, that plays a big role, you know, when you're when your quarterback who was probably going to be one of the better quarterbacks in the league goes down injured. Not a surprise with it being you know, him going down injured. That's why he's a eighth year senior, whatever he is. Um, you know, Cam rising gets hurt and, and it just kind of exposes this offense. So, um, that's, that's kind of the thing I thought of when I thought of the Utah offense was this new OC and how it doesn't really feel like they made a move to a nice young and up and coming, excuse me, coordinator who they might hire as their OC next year or something like that. They just kind of hire, they just kind of promoted a guy and uh, who who had done the job before, and they were like, "Hey, this kind of works," but maybe he's not necessarily better. Maybe the backup goalie's not better. But let's see if we can fire this team up a little bit. Yeah, I sort of get it. Like you, you sometimes do the midseason move to give one of your position coaches who you think could be a future coordinator a chance to actually get in that seat, call plays, understand what goes into that that you don't understand until you're actually in that position. And, you know, but you, but you also have it like in Bajakian's case, a guy working as an offensive analyst after getting fired from Northwestern after four years there. And it's like, okay, but this guy is on staff, knows the playbook, has called plays a bunch over his career. He was previously at Tennessee under Bush Jones and Central Michigan, I believe. Before that, I believe he was with uh, Jones at Central Michigan, Cincy, and Tennessee. A guy who has called plays for a lot of years, has familiarity with the personnel, knows the playbook. Sometimes a fresh set of eyes. So, you know, a new voice can be helpful. Still kind of cynical about that having a real noticeable impact because the bigger problem is one you pointed out that your offense was probably only going to succeed if Cam Rising, a guy with multiple, multiple extended season ending injuries to this point in his career, can stay healthy for the full season. And sure, sure enough, after missing all of last season with a, I think after, he had a knee injury in the 2022 Rose Bowl, missed all of last season as a result of it gets a hand injury against Baylor in their Big 12 opener early in this season. And you kind of had Isaac Wilson for a while. They tried to bring back Rising for the Arizona State game. Didn't go so well. And basically immediately after that shifted from, it was this long, long, long run of him being, I, I saw our 10, 12 friends point this out a few times, of him being him being day-to-day for almost literal months, mm-hmm. Bobby. Him starting as Arizona State, that going badly, and them just being like, okay, if this guy is going to basically perform at the same level as the freshman, let's not expose him to greater injury. Possibly he comes back for an eighth college season, which is a very funny sentence to say. 
their starter, the guy who's going to be starting against the Cougars and likely for the rest of the season is Isaac Wilson, a freshman. He's the younger brother of BYU alum Zach Wilson, you may recall from facing the Cougs in 2020 and being a high first round pick the season following. Wilson's got a great arm. He showed it off, I thought, in stretches that game against TCU. The problem is he was usually showing off that arm on long incompletions. They had two different fourth and shorts where they tried to throw a deep ball, which I sort of I sort of get it as a possible arm punt situation, but also maybe on fourth and short, give your freshman quarterback a higher percentage pass here. Like you, <laughs> like I watched that game and afterwards I'm not like, why, you know, why did the OC get fired? Yeah, man. <laughs> seems, seems like, seems like a personnel issue, the freshman quarterback, but also there were points where I'm just like, this is the offense you're running for a freshman. This is it's kind of curious. I think he's going to be a good quarterback long-term, but, He's a true freshman. And if you take out the Utah State game, he has almost double the number of interceptions as touchdowns. I know I spent a decent amount of last episode talking about how Kansas had struggled throwing the ball, and then they mostly lit up the Cougars last Saturday. I'll wear that one. It was, was a prediction of things to come that did not come. Kansas at least had a veteran starting quarterback, veteran backs and receivers. Utah is a true freshman who struggled. The Utes do have a pair of pretty good veteran pass catchers, a receiver, Dorian Singer, and their tight end, Brant Keithy. Keithy's another seventh-year guy, has really struggled staying healthy. I mean, that's why he's had seven college seasons, uh, but has been mostly able to stay on the field this year. He's a single ranch alum, too, so I'm sure he'll have plenty of family and friends in the crowd on Saturday. Another, another one of the top receivers, Money Parks, is a Texas guy, too. He's originally from Alito. This needs to be your get-right game for the defense, bottom line. I'll give this defense credit. The last time they had a real stinker, they followed up with a quality performance against Iowa State. Hope that holds true here because as wretched as Utah's offense has been, Bobby, pretty good defense they got there up in Salt Lake City, don't they? Yeah, um, that defense is salty. Uh, it held a TCU offense to 13 points and lost. Um, that is just absolutely brutal. Um you know, the Cougs have scr- struggled on the offensive line and Van Fillinger is uh, their lead sack getter. And it could be a long day for the Cougs if uh, if he gets if he just busts loose, you know, to your point earlier, this is arguably the worst defensive line that we faced uh, Kansas uh, versus Kansas. And they still had what was it? Four sacks, five sacks. Six sacks. Yeah, six sacks. Even better, right? I I remember counting five, um, you know, six sacks, and you have a guy who has just been eating opponents, almost getting a sack a game. It could get real ugly real quick for this offensive line, especially if we see any injuries again. Uh, this feels like a game, kind of where uh, neither team can score. Um, this Cougar offense doesn't do a great job of putting up points and neither does this Utah uh, defense, but um, the secondary for Utah, pretty good. The, uh, the, the D line though, it feels like this could get very ugly, very quickly. And if uh, the, the way I see the Cougs offense producing at all is going to be a lot of uh, Zeon Chris granted he's healthy, uh, breaking contain and picking up lots of yardage that way more so than I do the Cougs just running the ball down their throats or uh, you know airing it out and and picking up a lot through the air that way. Even without any consistent support from their offense, you're just still only allowing 16.4 points per game. Like that's that's crazy. U of H has faced some good defenses this year in the schedule to date. I'm pretty confident this Utah team will be the best defense we'll see in the regular season. Van Fillinger, glad you name-checked him. Absolute beast. Leads his team in tackles for loss and sacks. For good measure, also has three pass breakups and a blocked kick. Like That's a guy who's all over the place. I don't think as a team they'll have as many sacks or interceptions as you might think when you kind of picture an elite defense in your mind's eye, but they're awesome. They're the real deal. And I think we should encourage Utah fans long-term, ultimately terrify those who have to see Utah annually, is the fact that they have this pretty stingy pass defense, but are also playing a ton of young guys in their secondary. Uh, their top two cornerbacks, Smith Snowden and Cameron Calhoun, have a combined nine pass breakups this season. Bobby, they're a sophomore and freshman, respectively. Like This isn't just a good defense, and once this group of upperclassmen cycles out, not so much. Like, this, is a, this is a team that's had probably 16, 17 years in a row of being well above average to elite defensively. That's a defensive culture. That is... That is the closest thing 
to like the U of H men's basketball defensive culture that you could get in a football program. They are their team. That's just not going to miss tackles. Lander Burton want to mention him too. big middle of the field, run support kind of linebacker. Mm-hmm. They operate of a four two five mostly, but they can be pretty multiple. We've said it a few different ways. Great, great, great defense. If U of H can string together two touchdown drives this entire game, it wouldn't just represent a good effort. I'd actually think that there's like a decent chance that the Cougars win this game, but that's the, the trick there, getting the two touchdown drives against a team that just doesn't doesn't regularly allow them and hasn't regularly allowed them against mostly better offenses than the than the U of H one that uh, mm-hmm. that they're going to see on Saturday. As optimistic as I'm about the the defense having their get right game, I don't know how you look at U of H's seven games this point and feel optimistic about scoring on the best defense you're going to see. Which which I love football because these moments sometimes you get you get expectation defying results, and I hope I'm talking to expectation defying result from the offense into existence here because it's it's going to be a tough game on Saturday against against this opponent. Yeah, you know they say matchups make ball games. It's kind of funny. Normally, you like to see elite on elite or good on good. You are seeing good on bad and good on bad. And it's going to be quite comical uh, to to see what the final score of this game is. You know, not to, not to spoil Picnus or anything that we're certainly about to do. Um, you know, to your point, I think if the Cougs can score two touchdowns here, you got a shot. But... Um, if you can, if you can come away with 17, I think you got a shot at this game. Not that I think that, I'd, I'd say a good that, shot. I'd go further. Yeah. That, that will, you know, not guaranteeing a win if we get 17, but this is absolutely one of those games that you think is going to be 14, uh, 10. And, uh, again, not to spoil pickness, but somehow this game's going to end up 42, 35 or some, something dumb like that, because that's just how football is, man. <laughs> We spent a lot of time talking about the absurdly good Utah defense. Going to tell you what's not absurdly good, Bobby. Uh, my attempts at picking the Kansas game last week. Mercifully, no real currency was gambled because I lost 110 pod blocks on three Ooh. unsuccessful picks. UH money line, UH plus six and a half points, and the game under a 46 and a half points. All unsuccessful <laughs> bets. Bobby, you were marginally less unsuccessful, but only because you wagered 10 fewer pod bucks and made one fewer bet you also took u of h plus six and a half and the u of h money line so you still lead me you have just over uh 1220 pod bucks to my just over 1113 somehow we're both still imaginary profitable uh on the season which you know big uh big i was so confident going into last game too i was like plus six and a half that is a i re-listened because i had to make sure i got got the right picks i'm keeping the season tally correctly we were both just like, how's this a six and a half point game? Like, <laughs> what do they see? Why don't they think it's going to be closer? We just lost by 28, and it was every bit the value of 28 points. The joy of being a college football fan sometimes. Bobby, what are your picks for this week for the Cougars and Utes? All right, so I am going to go. Drum roll, please. No, just kidding. No, uh, no drum roll here. Um, I am going to take for 50 imaginary pod bucks. I am going to take Utah minus three and a half. And then I'm going to take the over with another 50 pod bucks. I'm going to take the over 36 and a half. Wow. Going, going with the over in a, a game. Where I think it's our... going to be like 24, 14. No, I mean, I, believe it or Some, not, I, you know, something like that. I gave that more thought than I expected, but I went with the under 36 and a half for 40 pod bucks. Like, Sorry, I believe these teams came combine for twenty four and fourteen or whatever the whatever the number that gets you to that total. I see a defensive it, touchdown or two. Yeah, could could be like I, I even though I'm making this pick and I'm not going back on it. I don't feel rock solid confident about any of it. But going with the under, and I'm going to break something out here. The three way the U of H has the lead, Utah has the lead, or tied at halftime. I'm t- taking U of H to have the lead at the half plus one seventy. Thought there was decent value in that for. 25 pod bucks. I'll go a little more conservative, just two bets for 65 imaginary bucks this week for me, man. I like it. All right. In the sea of not positivity, going to have a little bit of an appetizer. Talk about Cougar men's basketball. We talked about in depth last week. They're having their, the annual, the preseason exhibition for charity that the NCAA now allows you to have and now allows you to talk about on like, the game they played in Shreveport against Ole Miss, which we can't report the results on, and nobody uh, nobody has 
gotten into deep enough into U of H or Ole Miss that I've seen to get the score from that one. Doesn't really matter, but public exhibition on Sunday the Fatia Center against Texas A and M. You said it best, Bobby. Kind of feels, kind of feels like you look at it like the spring game. Like you don't don't look at it as, as a game. Like Kelvin Sampson is not going to sub in this one the same way as he even would in like a non conference. Like he is going to have a much more open rotation this one than I expect he'll have against Jackson State in the opener. Even though Texas A and M is going to be a much better program than Jackson State this year. Keep all the caveats in mind when looking at this result, and, and Texas A&M is a quality opponent for this, Bobby, what what do you want to see from the Cougars when they get out in the court and we can actually see how they do? Yeah, for me, I'm looking, um, I know you said, and I and I agree with you that we're not going to see, you know, he's going to be a little bit more liberal with his subs and things like that, but I, I am interested to kind of see what a rotation might look like um, and and how deep he may be taking it. I think if you see some substantial minutes out of out of your freshman, that's going to tell us a little bit of some a little bit something. Um, kind of interested to see what he's going to play with in terms of different lineups. He's going to throw some things out there that we might not see a ton, and he's just kind of testing it out. Do we go, you know, multiple big men? You know, where you have where you have somebody like Wani and. Uh, set out there Tugler and Wani um, at the same time, kind of both playing a five and, 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 and what that looks like. And then also the freshmen, right? How much confidence one, how good do the, do the freshmen look? And then, um, you know, two, what does, if they do come out and look good, or you see a lot of minutes being played by them in the scrimmage. Yeah. That's kind of what the scrimmage is here for, but does that give us a little bit of a, of, of a clue of how deep, um, Coach Hampton wants to take this rotation. What if they go out and they don't play a lot of minutes? Those freshmen don't play a lot of minutes. Are you going, well, maybe he's holding them back and he doesn't want the, you know, and so I'm just interested to see how he's going to hold, hold those lineups um, and, and how he's going to play those, uh, those freshmen and, and how it's going to affect our depth going forward and look different for this, uh, for the season and, and for the title hopes. I had a tough time picking. My mine's kind of twofold. And again, I'm che- cheating here. And I think the more personnel specific one is how how Mule Suzan looks as your likely first team starting point mm-hmm. guard. No one's gonna be Jamal Shed. Just curious what this looks like with him filling this very critical position. And my more general one, the one I couldn't separate from this one in terms of like what I want to know is kind of to your last point. Yeah, it's going to be a more liberal substitution pattern. It's not going to necessarily look like it does during a game. I'm still curious who the first guys come off the bench are. I still think the first group off the bench, I still think he's going to start the five that are the five best right now. I don't think there's going to be like two or three freshmen in the starting lineup. I think he's going to, I think he's going to start a starting five that's going to look very much like his starting five against Jackson State. I also think the first guys come off the bench are going to be at least somewhat indicative of who your first bench guys are this season because there are a lot of names possibly there. But we don't know. We don't know who's going to be the priority guys. We have some good ideas. Like we expect Terrence Arsenal to get a lot of minutes off the bench. We, we, I think Mercy Miller, the, the freshman, is the freshman we think could be working his way in there, get a lot of minutes. Like how? Who are the first guys off the bench? What's that priority look like before the game stops resembling stops resembling uh, the regular game that you see the more liberal substitutions and stop stop seeing as many things that you can kind of extrapolate on those of us who are who are starved to see a cougar men's basketball and and overread into things that kellen sams is going to sternly tell us after the game not to over uh, overread and this isn't gonna be anything like this and the dumbest people are the people who like try to take something out of it and i'm sorry kelvin i'm gonna try not to be that guy but I- i'm just so freaking excited and first time in seven months that we have cougar men's basketball that we could dissect yeah just excited overall to uh to just see Cougar basketball. Going back into the uh, current in sports season, the fall sports, uh, talk about volleyball first. You had a tough road swing coming in. You lost both matches from the Arizona swing of your Big 12 schedule. New coming in this season is going to be a very tough part of, well, we did, didn't think Arizona would be as much. I think they're overachieving what we thought they'd be uh, preseason, but knew this would be a tough uh, conference schedule, and this, this was a very tough week of it. At ASU, the number 13 team in the country, I believe at the time of the game knew they would be the toughest of the two opponents credit to the Cougars. They kept it pretty close. That first set though, the Sun Devils ultimately prevailed. You didn't play badly in that one, but 
yeah, that, yeah, that first that was probably the closest to human that ASU was going to be offensively, and you weren't able to finish that one off. And then the second sets, not that you weren't uncompetitive, you were down, I think, 22-20 late in the second set, but as veteran teams often do, and as we know in the preview, ASU is a really veteran team, so Neville's found a way to close that one out and then finish off the Cougars without too much drama in the third set. So I'm not trying to take anything negative away from that one. ASU's as good as advertised, just... Just a, a tough way to start a road trip, man. Yeah, maybe you'd like to see um, going into extra points. I guess you could say with with the uh, with the Sun Devils there. You'd like to see maybe you pull us you pull a set out there, but definitely a hard uh, harder out to uh, to start that uh, road trip for sure. Got a truly incredible individual effort from Kate Georgias in the Friday lost Arizona, but unfortunately, he said it was a loss and one. And I think the unfortunate part where the Cougars really didn't look like they were going to win in either of the final two ultimately decisive sets. Arizona really came out and fire in the first set. I think, frankly, it was a credit to the Cougars. They actually kept that one as close as they ended up being in the final margin. Cougars fought back one in the second set. but And again, that was the only real disappointing thing for me out of this road trip. Arizona took those final two sets. Really incredible individual effort from Kate George Yaz. Had a program record, broke her program record from the fall 2021 season with 36 digs in four sets. Naturally, got the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Week honors, but felt like, and maybe missed opportunity is stronger than I want to say, but felt like something one level below a missed opportunity to, uh, to, not, to not push Arizona a bit harder in the Friday game last week. Yeah, for me, you know... It- kind of going through watching the uh the play by play and then watching the game again it was uh a, it was a match of runs you know in the first set Cougs actually um are are up 16 for uh, are holding tight 16 14 uh give up a big five point run to take it to 21 14 first set was over from there uh Cougs took the uh, a very close second set um, and then, you know, set three was the same story as set one. You keep it close. Arizona goes on a big run and it's pretty much over from there. Um, do want to shout out Andy Cook with 26 assists uh, and Georgiatis, like you mentioned, an absolute stunning and mind boggling 35 digs in uh, in that match. So just a uh, one you'd like to see the Cougars win there. But um yeah, just kind of one of those matches that you'd like to see it maybe go into five or uh, you come away with a win there. Up next, the Cougars are going to host the current number 23, the Baylor Bears, at the Pratia Center. Top 25 team in their 3-3 three and three in Big 12 play, if you want an idea of how brutally difficult this conference is for volleyball. The Bears gave Arizona State their lone conference loss of the current season, the Arizona State team. I was just talking about how good they were. Granted, it was at the Farrell Center, which I didn't realize Farrell Center is still being used for uh, – for volleyball, they have not dynamited that place uh, yet. Had a really impressive non-conference win from Minnesota as well, though I think it's worth noting with Baylor, they're only one in three uh, away from home. This season, their top offensive player is a 6'4 senior outside hitter, Elise McGee, multi-time All-Big 12 selection. They also have sophomore uh, Kendall Murphy, who's having averaging just a, a hair under three kills per set. They also have the other All-Big 12 libero selection from last year, uh, along with Kate Georgiatis, a senior Lauren Bersenio, so definitely a big part of the Baylor defensive spine as well. Would be a great opportunity for a top 25 win. And I know it's probably same day, at least for everyone listening, but I hope if you can, you take one of the few opportunities remaining to get out there for TS Center and watch this program in action, because this could be, I think, postseason at large, out of the picture here. Just no longer have the ability to even get to that resume. Still a good win. You could still mess up Baylor season a little bit, and I think the way they've been away from home, it's not unreal, unrealistic to say the uh, the Cougs could possibly get the upset uh, tomorrow night at the Fertitta Center. Yeah, you know, my kind of takeaway was a little bit different than yours. I think if you want to have any shred of a chance of making the postseason, I think it starts with a big run and it starts with a win here. You're going to have to go on a big run when a fair amount of these conference games that are remaining. This is your last one of your last chances to really make a, uh, have a, have a big opportunity for a win that you can put on your resume. I don't necessarily think that this team is a uh, tournament team um, no matter, no matter what, but I think if you want to have any shot at it, this is going to be the game where you have to kind of start that. 
I, I mean, I think your shot was your shot was, and not that like, this is a, a very difficult thing to do. Something no team has done this season. Your shot was beating Arizona State at Arizona, and then not drop. Arizona State, Arizona State, and then not dropping the game to Arizona. Yeah, don't that, necessarily that was your disagree. There. I think if you, I like I said, I think if you can suddenly go on a run here and you win this match and then you win some other big matches that you have, I think you still got a shot. But I don't think it's. I think I think if you go on a run that you are kind of exp- that you're hoping for with this, it puts you on the bubble. It doesn't put you in the tournament per se. Uh, Cooks definitely a must win, regardless of the of the uh, the postseason picture. In the Friday game, they will go on the road to Orlando to take on UCF. Sort of weird to see because UCF was the premier AAC volleyball program before the Cougars. Where, if you'll recall, actually, I think the 2022 UCF at Houston match that was that ma- the regular season match of the season. That was when the Cougs beat them in that one. That for me was this is a serious program. This is this U of H program under David Rare has arrived. They're pretty terrible this year. Uh, their longtime head coach uh, retired or kind of semi-retired, moved to coach in the pro, new pro volleyball league before last season, and it's been pretty rough sledding there. One season and change in the Big 12. They're 1-6 in, in conference play this year with their lone win coming home to West Virginia, who they notably lost to in Morgantown fairly recently. I hate to speak in absolutes or hesitate to speak in absolutes, but this should be a win. Don't think I am overstating mm-hmm. the Cougs' ability in this one by thinking they should win this. Yeah, absolutely. I have that here too. Um, one of those absolute must win, must win games, even if not for a tournament um, appearance, just for where you stand as a volleyball program. Both teams having a down year this year. Um, but yeah, definitely want to see the Cougs. If, if what we've seen the last couple of years is what we believe this program to be, you beat teams like UCF. No doubt. A program where we don't have that expectation is Cougar Soccer, where I will try to be mercifully brief this week. We are near the end of the season. You had the Utah swing of the Big 12 schedule last week. Lost one nothing to Utah. Respectable performance, I, I think, given what this team has been this year. Did jump out to me that despite being down in the second half, because uh, Utah got their lone goal in the 35th minute, you were outshot 12-4 to in the second half. Kind of a recurring theme with this team, a theme that I'm going to come back to in this segment. This team's inability, even against an opponent holding a lead, to possess the ball and to create even an equivalent number of chances of the team that they should be chasing. Like you should be, you should be the aggressor. You should be the team pressing forward and getting more chances. It just doesn't consistently happen with this team who's had many chances to unfortunately be at a deficit. The really dispiriting one for me was uh losing to BYU 3-0 last night. Not that we were expecting the Cougars to win, but another game in Big 12 play that kind of falls in the category of didn't expect to win. I am still surprised at how uncompetitive this was. BYU got both their goals in the third, the first 32 minutes of the match, and despite that, despite playing the entire second half with a 2 nothing or 3 nothing deficit, Bobby, UH was outshot 14-2 to two in the second half. Again, you think of the multi-goal deficit, U of H would be the more aggressive team, the team capable of putting more shots on the target, even if ultimately you're still a losing team, but you'd be wrong there. Uh, the only nice thing I can say about this one is uh, kudos to BYU for honoring U of H's seniors before uh, their senior night on Monday night. Yep. Uh, mercifully, this weekend will be the end of the 2024 Cougar soccer season. The Cougs will host West Virginia on Friday night, as you can probably imagine this team is no longer in the picture for the big 12 tournament uh west virginia was actually your first u of h big 12 win ever bobby the trivia question the answer to is always going to be west the west the west virginia soccer game last year unfortunately for the cougs at present west virginia is a much better team this season they've won seven of their 10 conference matches i don't know maybe you catch some senior day lightning in a bottle you beat an Arizona team that I didn't expect you'd beat. West Virginia, maybe catch him napping a little bit with their conference postseason fate. Pretty much decided at this point. Not betting on it, metaphorically or literally, but that's the close I get to talking myself into it. And I, I don't want to sound so grim, but I mean, this team's one and nine in Big 12 play, and the nine have been all pretty uncompetitive. Yep. That's it. Got what nothing else is there to add? I mean, nothing. It, it's nothing. just. It's not good soccer. Like even, 
I've watched more UH women's soccer this year than I probably ever have just because of ESPN Plus. And then, <laughs> that's, you know, that, I wish I wish you had been. I wish you had gotten to at least see the fall twenty one season. I promise you, man. At one time, this was a good soccer team. That team, I'm not just saying as a Cougar fan, deserved to be in the postseason as at large. Yeah, and this and it's just, this is not even in the galaxy of that. Sorry. Yep it's it's just been it's just been really really rough to watch. And I still think this team. I, I still think from back to the preview, this team is better than some of their parts. Do I think this team should be unbeaten in Big Twelve play, having eight or nine wins? No. Like I, I think there's a, there's a hard ceiling, a hard ceiling, not super super far from where UH is right now. But I think this team is better than losing four to one to Cincinnati. I think this team is better than two fucking goals scored in the entirety of conference play. Because this isn't this isn't Big Twelve volleyball. I mean, Texas Tech's a good program. TCU is mm-hmm. a good program. There, there is not an equivalent team to the Arizona State team that was talking about volleyball in soccer this year. Maybe, maybe Tech's close, yep. but this isn't like a oh, you need a bunch of years to get competitive. No, Jaime Frias inherited a program that should have been in the fall twenty twenty one tournament and has parlayed it into four fucking conference wins in three seasons and a lot of bad soccer. All right, Bobby, we're getting close to the end and. I'm glad we can end this on a positive note because I think our last two updates are a pretty positive nature. We're going to take a peaceful stroll over the links. It's Golf Corner. Well, after that wonderful intro that uh, Sam has has uh, wonderfully made for me, I do appreciate that, buddy. Your number 26 Lady Cougar golf team traveled to wonderful San Marvelous, Texas. And for the Jim West Invitational, this was a fairly deep tournament. Five top 50 teams. Uh, the Cougs once again didn't have anyone go incredibly low with only one top 10 finisher. Um, but that being said, your top four players all finished within the top 20. Been saying for uh, last year and this year that what this team really needs is not just one person to go low and then everyone else to be okay and just kind of hang on. What we need is we need everyone to go middle low um and for everyone to finish top 20 um leads to a runner-up trophy one shot off the lead uh this wraps up the cougar uh the lady cougar fall schedule cougs take two runner-up finishes and a win at the ou schooner classic or whatever however you pronounce it schooner Schooner. the schooner schooner classic whatever um that's an sec school i don't have to worry about them anymore um but uh, they won that tournament as well. Uh, their, the worst finish that we had in their fall season was actually a third place at the Kentucky tournament. And so you can jump on board the bandwagon now. I highly recommend it. This is the top 26 team. I know it sounds weird, but they rank all the way down to, I want to say, 50. Um, in in women's golf, they'll rank down to 50. Um, if we had any other team, if our, if our football team was top um, receiving votes, TDECU would be packed. If, uh, if, if baseball was receiving votes, that stadium would be crowded as well. I highly recommend you hop on board. You at least follow this um, as much as uh, smack as I've talked about the new scoring website and things like that. It's actually gotten pretty good over the last, uh, this, this fall season. It looks like they got their first, their first, uh, first year bugs out of the way. It's been very nice tracking tournaments on it. Um, still not as, not as much fun as golf stat, but a, uh, I highly recommend you hop on the bandwagon, uh, in the spring, this team could be the first women's golf team at U of H to make it out of a regional and go to the NCAA championship. So it's going to be a really exciting spring. Hopefully we get the same results in the spring that we did, uh, from the fall. Yeah. Fully coast on everything you say, like fin- finishing at worst third in the stacked field. Cause U of H has been playing, stacked fields at all these events yep. like this is this isn't just oh u of h is the one top 25 ish level team no they're regularly playing with i would say four to six other minimum top 50 programs i, I think this event had like five or six 
it had top five. 50, five as well. And, and to your more off topic point there, I'll just thank you for the sport I'm about to talk about. Spike Mark still seems like it's inferior to golf stat. And I just loved, I loved how 2001 internet <laughs> golf. Stat it's, just yeah. like, it's like, could come back in time to when I didn't have gray hair on my face, but I'd kill for something even half as good as spike mark in tennis, just with centralized information rankings. And I could easily see how an event happened. I know I have to go to five different websites and hope, hope someone in the kindness of their heart updated one of those five websites. <laughs> uh, that, that is a good thing with golf. And yeah, this is going to be a really good team. And it, to what we've said repeatedly, what you've said repeatedly that they are, that they're finishing high in the most sustainable way possible. It's not just one to two good golfers carrying your five in a tournament. It is, one through five, you have you have golfers very very consistently good. Like and that's that's gonna be the the path to being really good and finishing up in the higher part of the Big Twelve standings coming to the championship in the spring is doing what this team has done so consistently, which I'm I'm really excited about. Can't wait to see them uh teed off in the spring. And last but not least, Cougar Tennis or Cougar Tennis Corner for this week. Music list for this week, but don't worry, I have something in the lab for that. We the Cougar Tennis intro will be back and in a way that doesn't potentially get our episode uh, blocked from from streaming <laughs> platforms. Apologies to uh, to the movie Challengers uh, on that just, one. Just just a real quick, just a real quick uh, behind the scenes. Um, it oh was really God. funny last week. So um, a former co-host still has access to the email, the uh, SH Podcast email, and yep, we got we haven't uh, deactivated his key card yet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, since he has Emeritus next to his name, we decided to let him keep his... He's just roaming the halls. It's very weird. Um, but he... Uh, for some reason. <laughs> yeah. He... Uh, but uh, he he sends us this, like, panicked uh, text. Like, guys, I don't know what you did. Did you guys slip in Nine Inch Nails? Wasn't it Nine Inch Nails? Uh, no, it was, into, it was Trent Reznor. Uh, full, yeah, full disclosure, the, the, the techno song that you heard the tennis corner intro. I thought I might've gotten it under the amount for fair use did not, <laughs> which is not surprising. So, the, the pivotal scene in the 2024 romantic drama challengers, the, the big match at the end had that, had that beat. It was an all original soundtrack by Trent Reznor. So that that's the context. And, and so, and so uh, we had a, we had a copyright claim from Trent Reznor and Dustin had like this mild, like, Hey, you guys know, I don't know if you slipped this in or something. And we were like, Oh no, it's tennis corner. Uh, and it's totally what it was for. And we just had this like idea. Like I was just sitting there picturing Trent Reznor, like listening to our podcast for some reason. It just, just like, punching the screen like that's my song and like calling his agent immediately so just that's why we don't have the uh the tennis theme this uh this week <laughs> yeah, gonna again gotta be in the lab where we, we will have a tennis corner intro yet uh but this week this week it's just gonna be me introing a uh, a week that was pretty light uh didn't have a college event uh but cougar sophomore valeria crohotina played in a international tennis federation itf w100 event in Tyler, if you want to learn something, W100 refers to the total prize pool, which for this event was $100,000. Uh, Valeria was officially an alternate for the event uh, because of her ITF ranking from her, her junior days, but would imagine the amount of pros able and willing to uh, trek to a low-level event in Tyler, Texas allowed her to uh, to get in the field for this one as an alternate. Got some match experience against a, uh, against a current professional, a former world top 200 player, uh, Ashley Kratzer, who just this season came off a multi-year PED ban, has been trying to kind of rebuild her career on the lower end of the uh, the tour this season. Valeria did lose in straight sets, uh, 6-3, 6-3 yesterday in Tyler, but I would say acquitted herself well against a professional who's six years older than her. And I thought this was cool because this is an ITF pro event. There were actually semi-reliable stats. And the one that stood out to me is that uh, Valeria's first serve percentage was 65% for this one, which means... 65% of the time her first serve was in play and didn't need to take a second serve where by nature you're going to be a bit more conservative and give your opponent a better chance of winning the point against you. You can't put that number into context, but a pretty solid number to have. Your target is kind of around 65, 70% that she did against a professional. I think I think that's pretty cool. Cool opportunity for her. Uh, most of the next few weeks for Cougar Tennis or similar ITM events, we'll possibly see Cougar Athletes. Our next college event is going to be uh, potentially the ITF sectional championships in 
early November. I believe it starts the seventh. Then you have a couple other school specific ones afterwards, one at Rice and one at Arizona State. Uh, with the possibility, I don't know uh, if that window is closing yet, of uh, maybe like Santa qualifying for the fall NCAA individual championships the week before Thanksgiving. So that's all the Cougar sports for us this week. Bobby, you want to take us home? Yeah, of course. So uh, as Sam said, that is it for this episode. We have gone fairly long. It's a busy season. This is the uh, the kind of thing Sam and I live for is every night there's pretty much some kind of cougar sport going on or uh, we're recording this podcast. That's why we do Tuesday nights because Wednesday nights uh, you can find some cougar sports. But we love doing this. And uh, if you have some feedback for us, you can email us at uh, shpodcast at gmail.com. You can find us on social media at sh podcast um, on Twitter. If you um, are still determined to make Blue Sky a thing, it'll be podcast.bsky.social. You can find Dustin over there. Uh, Sam and I don't go over there, just being frank and honest with you guys. But uh, yeah. Dustin will gladly respond to you over there. Um, I mentioned the email. I kind of put it out of order. Normally I go Twitter first, but uh, again, shpodcast at gmail.com for any questions, uh, any feedback. We are more than happy to hear it. And if you want your feedback to really matter to us, you can join our Patreon. Our Patreon is $5 a month. Um, what's that? 60 cents a day. I think Sam always 16, says yeah, 16, 16 yeah. cents a day. That's pretty good there. Um, you know, minimum five bucks. If you want to give us more, we will gladly take it as well. Um, but basically what that does just kind of give you guys a little insight that pays for our hosting. Um, it costs us money to actually host these things on a, uh, on a server for you guys to listen to them. Um, and it, and it pays for, for things like that throughout the, uh, through, through the podcast, um, um, sphere, you know, if we need to, you know, we, we have different hosts and different things that we, that we pay for, um, on a monthly basis to provide this content to you. We don't make a ton of money doing this. This isn't a, uh, this isn't something that we do to be rich. We do this for a little bit of uh, a passion for Cougar sports. And so, uh, your donation goes towards that. And then, um, yeah, we really appreciate it. If you uh, want to do five bucks a month, you also get some premium episodes. Um, we did a uh, report card for the Cougars halfway through the season, which I think we might change now after uh, seven games. But uh, we've also been doing a lot of post game wrap up shows and we'll do some stuff during basketball season as well that we're really excited for. Um, so if you want to support us, patreon.com search SH podcast over there. And I think that's it, Sam. So what do we always say at the end? Go Cougs. All right. Go Cougs. Let's go.